Excellencies, colleagues and friends, I'm delighted to welcome you to this Generation Equality Forum panel on the crisis of the human rights of women and girls, including in the COVID-19 context and the issues of migration, social and racial justice. Interpretation is available in English, French, Spanish and Nahuatl. My name is Lauren Ahrens and I'm the head of the Gender, Sexuality and Identity team at Amnesty International and I'll be moderating this session. I'd like to thank UN Women and In Mujeres in the Government of Mexico for all the preparation that they've done. As we all know, it's now been 26 years since the adoption of the Beijing Platform for Action. And while there has been much positive change for women and girls' human rights during this period, so much more is needed. Across the globe, gender remains a major factor in determining the extent to which individuals will be able to realize their human rights and more attention is urgently needed to address the impact of intersectional discrimination on the ability of women in all their diversity to access their rights. Most recently, the COVID-19 pandemic and responses have exacerbated inequalities and human rights concerns affecting women and girls. Gender-based violence has increased during lockdowns. Additional caregiving responsibilities have fallen disproportionately on women. Barriers to accessing sexual and reproductive health services have increased. And additional policing has resulted in further harassment and abuse of women from marginalized, criminalized and stigmatized communities. But while the pandemic has highlighted the really precarious nature of advances in women's rights, it's also shown what can be done to respond to a crisis where there is political will. The aim of this panel is to reflect on the achievements and setbacks over the last two and a half decades in women and girls' human rights, and to identify opportunities and recommendations for further advances. It's an opportunity to reflect on the differentiated impact of systematic discrimination across the diversity of women, and to exchange ideas on how diverse groups of women can challenge the current human rights crisis. To do this, I'm joined by six really inspirational panelists. The first is Ms. Gladys Acosta Vargas, the chairperson of the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, the CEDAW Committee. The second is Ms. Charlotte Bunch, professor and founding member and senior scholar at the Center for Women's Global Leadership at Rutgers University in the USA. That is Ms. Lyric Thompson, Senior Director at the International Center for Research on Women. Next is Ms. Myrna Cunningham, co-founder and vice president of the Indigenous Peace in Nicaragua. Ilaria Bottigliero, the Director of Policy, Research and Learning at the International Development Law Organization, IDLO. And finally, Ms. Helena Malena Garzon, founder of Colectivo, Caminando Sin Fronteras in Spain. Before we start, however, we have a short video from the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Agradezco la oportunidad de dirigirme a este foro. El compromiso incansable de los movimientos, de las líderes feministas y las defensoras de los derechos humanos han producido muchos avances en nuestro largo e inacabado camino hacia la igualdad de género. El progreso realizado desde la histórica declaración y plataforma de acción de Beijing hace 25 años es incuestionable. No obstante, también ha sido desigual y lento, reflejando cómo el patriarcado sigue resistiendo hacia el cambio. No es de extrañar que la pandemia del COVID-19 haya afectado más a las mujeres y a las niñas, especialmente a las más marginadas y a las que corren más riesgo de quedarse atrás. Esta vulnerabilidad es el resultado de modelos políticos, sociales y económicos que siguen excluyéndolas en toda su diversidad. Desde la tragedia humana que es la pandemia, tenemos el deber y la notable oportunidad de recuperarnos mejor que antes. La generación de la igualdad es nuestra llamada colectiva a la acción. Tenemos que aprovechar esta oportunidad y forjar narrativas positivas y contrarrestar la fragmentación dentro de nuestros movimientos. Tenemos que proporcionar un mayor apoyo político, público y financiero a activistas y movimientos de la sociedad civil 
y a su lucha contra todas las formas de opresión. Debemos reflexionar y desarrollar nuestra propia capacidad para entender la interseccionalidad y la relación con la discriminación, los estereotipos y quién tiene poder y quién no. Esto debe integrarse de forma significativa a nuestra forma de vivir, trabajar y relacionarnos con todos los actores de la sociedad. Asimismo, debemos garantizar que nuestras leyes, políticas y programas sean interseccionales, así como justos e inclusivos, sostenibles y eficaces. Para ello necesitamos datos, investigación y análisis totalmente desglosados, especialmente en nuestros esfuerzos de respuesta y recuperación en el marco del COVID-19. Colegas, ya sea a través de la Marcha de las Mujeres, las iniciativas Hashtag MeToo, Hashtag Ni Una Menos o Hashtag Total Shutdown y muchas otras, el poder de los movimientos feministas ha sido particularmente evidente en los últimos años. Las mujeres y las niñas han estado y siguen estando en el centro de los movimientos por la justicia social. Los ejemplos son muchos, lanzando el movimiento Black Lives Matter, luchando por la igualdad de derechos de migrantes, protegiendo nuestro medio ambiente y el clima, protestando contra la corrupción, la desigualdad y las leyes discriminatorias de ciudadanía. Como alta comisionada por los derechos humanos y colíder de la Coalición de Acción para la Igualdad de Generación sobre Movimientos y Liderazgo Feminista, espero que nos arremanguemos aún más y aceleremos nuestros esfuerzos en los próximos cinco años. Esta reunión de feministas inspiradoras, decididas y generosas, de la sociedad civil, los gobiernos, el sector privado y las organizaciones intergubernamentales, puede aportar la energía y la visión necesarias. Espero seguir trabajando con ustedes hacia la justicia interseccional, hacia la igualdad de género, hacia la plena realización de todos los derechos de las mujeres y las niñas, hacia una generación de igualdad. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. So I'll now start by asking. Oh, I'm sorry, I have a terrible echo. Are you able to hear me? You can hear me, I'll continue, excuse me. I'll start by asking the panel some questions, after which there'll be a space for interactive dialogue. So if you have a question for the panel, please, I really want to encourage you to put that in the um, Q&A function, which is where the and more are. Sorry, it said the host me. Excuse me. Um, so I was just encouraging um, everyone to send questions to the panelists through the Q&A function of the chat. And I also wanted to say that to make sure we have time for a really solid Q&A, I will be asking panelists to limit their interventions to four minutes. And I will be um, quite assertive in interrupting after four minutes. So I apologize for that in advance, but it's to keep the conversation flowing. Um, and with that, I'd like to turn first to, um, to Gladys, the chairperson of the CEO committee, to ask what are the main threats in the current global context, including the COVID-19 crisis, to fulfill women and girls' human rights? And most importantly, how should we address them? Thank you. Muchísimas gracias. Eh, en primer lugar, quisiera agradecer esta invitación a los gobiernos de México y, y de Francia, así como a ONU Mujeres y a las organizaciones feministas y de la sociedad civil que han hecho posible este evento. Eh, me pregunta sobre las amenazas. Eh, lo primero que quisiera decir es que encuentro mucha, una gran amenaza cuando se afecta los marcos normativos protectivos. Lo que ha pasado en Turquía, por ejemplo, eh, es, es preocupante porque su gobierno ha decidido retirarse del convenio del Consejo de Europa sobre prevención y lucha contra la violencia contra las mujeres y la violencia doméstica, que es ampliamente conocido justamente como el convenio de Estambul. Eh, y con, esperamos desde el Comité CEDAW que, esta, esta, que haya una rectificación de esta de este grave hecho que ha producido rechazo internacional y que además ha, ha sacado a las mujeres a la calle. Eh, como hemos visto, eh, las mujeres de Turquía valientemente han salido para protestar eh, por esta situación. Entonces, los marcos internacionales de protección a las mujeres pues tienen que ser 
eh, mantenidos y tienen que ser cumplidos. Entonces es una amenaza muy grave que esto suceda. Eh, una segunda amenaza me parece que eh, está eh, vinculada al sistema económico imperante que eh, afecta a las mujeres en el sentido de eh, que no existen suficientes mecanismos de supervisión estatal para proteger la fuerza de trabajo de millones de mujeres que están ocupadas en sectores informales y precarios de la economía. Me refiero al trabajo doméstico, a los servicios, a la agricultura, eh, donde las mujeres trabajan con salarios mínimos, sin protección social muchas veces, y que eso ha, ha empeorado durante la pandemia, eh, porque además muchos estados no cuentan con suficientes recursos para financiar niveles de protección social que son muy importantes cuando las personas, y en este caso las mujeres, han perdido sus ingresos. Un tercer problema que es una real amenaza es la conflictividad armada en el mundo. Creo que eh, está muy claro que las dificultades en la pacificación en ciertas zonas es, representa una grave amenaza para la vida y también para la integridad sexual de las mujeres y las niñas. Otra amenaza que hay que tomar en consideración hoy en día es que la migración, la migración es en condiciones peligrosas e inseguras como la que existe cuando hay políticas de migración excluyentes y discriminatorias contra las mujeres y las niñas, tienen un efecto de alto riesgo para ellas porque facilitan la acción de redes, de tráfico de personas, de explotación laboral y hasta de formas contemporáneas de esclavitud. Eh, sin embargo, en, en tiempos de pandemia, el, el cierre de fronteras también ha significado un problema porque eh, se, se puede bloquear la ayuda internacional justamente a mujeres y a niñas que están en riesgo. Eh, también quisiera resaltar como amenaza la prevalencia de exacerbadas formas de racismo en contra de, la, de las mujeres indígenas, de las mujeres afrodescendientes, de minorías raciales, sobre todo cuando los estados reprimen sus movilizaciones y cuando permiten que actores privados las ataquen en respuesta a la defensa de sus territorios, del agua, de los recursos naturales que son indispensables para sus comunidades. Eh, no quiero dejar de decir que las omisiones de la justicia también son una grave amenaza. Porque estas omisiones y la sistemática impunidad ante las diversas formas de violencia que limitan la vida de las mujeres y las niñas, en la pandemia se ha acentuado y lamentamos mucho que la justicia no haya cumplido su rol y no esté cumpliendo su rol de proteger eh, a las mujeres y a las niñas. Por último, no quiero eh, decir que es, que es lo, lo de menor importancia, pero es muy preocupante la tolerancia a expresiones políticas contrarias a los avances a los, en los derechos humanos de las mujeres, particularmente los derechos sexuales y los derechos reproductivos. Muchas de estas eh, acciones en contra de los derechos de las mujeres están pues, eh, apoyadas por instituciones religiosas y por poderes económicos que ponen en riesgo las vidas y el pleno desarrollo de las mujeres y las niñas. Y me quedo aquí para respetar el tiempo. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. Can I ask that same question to Charlotte? Yes, thank you very much. And uh, thank you uh, to Mexico and to you and women for the invitation to speak here. And I am glad to have participated in some of the planning for the Mexico City meeting. Um, well, I, I agree with everything Gladys has said. Um, So I will focus a little bit differently on how I think these threats are, are being experienced in terms of why is this happening? And I think one of the main reasons why all of these threats that Gladys put forward are happening is because of the achievements that women's rights and human rights have made in the past couple of decades. And in particular, I think, the recognition of women's rights as human rights and the recognition of sexual rights and the recognition uh, and the campaigns for the diverse rights of women, uh, indigenous women, women of color, black women, et cetera, has actually uh, 
brought the threat of backlash against human rights that we see so intensely today. So I don't think we can really talk about that threat without acknowledging that it is the very progress that Beijing represents that has brought the biggest backlash against human rights that we are experiencing at this moment. And it is a backlash that has focused on all of those gains. And in particular, I think uh, the effort to broaden the impact of human rights uh, and to begin to recognize the human rights of all people and not just a, a certain uh, narrow slab of civil and political rights as important as they are, uh, but to move toward economic and social rights, sexual rights, rights of minorities. To me, this is the backlash that we are seeing. It has focused in particular, and I will say a little more about this one, on sexual uh, and reproductive rights. I think precisely because these are the rights that are seen as taking away the power of men and masculine based institutions, we could call it the patriarchy, um, has given uh, to keep other groups in line. So to actually have these rights, rights that are family based rights that have been assumed uh, to sexuality by men uh, challenged has I think touched the nerve, the particular nerve of patriarchy. Uh, I think it's connected to all the other rights. But if you look today at this struggle, it really is at the forefront of undermining all human rights. And I think that's why it's so important to focus on it, not only because it's rights for women uh, and control of our bodies and our sexuality, but because those very rights are eroding the acceptance of all human rights. And I take as an example, uh, the previous Trump administration's commission on inalienable rights, which was specifically aimed at narrowing the definition of rights uh, to only a very small number. And I think this is replicated in many other authoritarian governments who don't even feel they have to recognize or abide by human rights at all. So the second thread I would point to is the rise of authoritarian governments. <coughs> and within that, the rise of nationalist intolerance, racism, uh, intolerance of all kinds of minorities, sexual minorities, racial minorities, uh, migrants, um, people who are coming from other countries. And I think this is a, a package of nationalist authoritarian reassertion, the strongman approach, um, which in unfortunately in many countries, the COVID uh, epidemic has increased because it has given an excuse for authoritarian governments to say these other issues uh, of racial justice, of women's rights, um, are not important. What's important, of course, is COVID. And in the name of that, all kinds of things are uh, sacrificed, particularly women's rights. The third area I would point to is what's happening to individual women's human rights defenders. And I think we've seen today in many parts of the world, women, the increase in the attack on women, women who are working in climate justice and defending land and minerals have been attacked, women who are working on any kind of agenda around sexual rights and climate justice and racism. We've seen many more deaths. Um, and I think one of the biggest challenges we have you know, is to see that when these individuals are targeted, whether killed or just uh, attempt to um, make them troublemakers, calling them anti-government, calling them Western, calling them lesbians. There are many different tactics, but the ways in which these are identified as people who shouldn't have a voice in society, even when they aren't murdered, they often lose their jobs. They often lose their families. Their families don't necessarily support them because the family feels threatened by their activism. So the struggle around women's human rights defenders is another way in which I think the threats uh, to human rights today uh, have been highlighted and are in crisis. Um, I don't know, I haven't kept track of time, but if I have a little more time, I would just add something that Gladys said, which is armed conflicts. 
um, I think again, the recognition of violence and rape and armed conflict, which is one of the great achievements of the 90s uh, and the early part of the 20th, 21st century, is also experiencing a backlash in which military governments and armed conflicts are reasserting that their right to um, attack the rights of women to rape, to do this, is a part of any war. Um, now, I think we also need to be challenging militarism and war in general, um, and peace and war is certainly one of the big threats everywhere, but in particular, in the human rights perspective, those efforts to get certain things understood as war crimes, to get certain crimes against humanity understood, um, are being eroded by this ideology that somehow we've gone too far. And maybe I'll end it with that because I think the thing I hear the most from the anti-right, um, anti-rights, sorry, from the anti-rights groups is you've gone too far. Um, and this is where exactly we need to go if we're going to defend human rights. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charlotte. And finally, can I ask that same question to Lyric? Certainly, and thanks to the organizers, to the moderator and my fellow speakers whose work I um, admire greatly and inspires me daily. Um, I'll co-sign everything that the previous two speakers have said and just particularly reflect on the fact that we are gathered here to mark what was supposed to be the 25th anniversary mm -hmm. of Beijing last year, uh, derailed by COVID, um, now marking the 26th year, um, that we had to innovate this space in response to the very threats that have just been described, which is to say there was zero confidence, understandably, that in now the year 2021, we would be able to organize a fifth world conference on women 26 years after Beijing, because there was not certitude that we would be able to arrive at the same rights standards for women and people of various genders and orientation um, that we were able to get. And that particularly for women of my generation who did not have our Beijing moment is a, a profound sadness, but also mm -hmm. a profound motivator to think about how we do our work differently in a way that is responsive to these twin um, barriers that we find ourselves facing. The organized, and very well-funded opposition movements um, that have, I think um, now, as, as Charlotte was saying, increasingly been co-opted by government and other institutions of power, um, but also the COVID-19 pandemic, and maybe I'll focus there for a moment since the other speakers didn't as quite as much. So, which is to say that I believe we'll talk next in the conversation about a number of the gains that have been made for women's human rights over this time period. And we have seen across the board, the COVID-19 pandemic reversing those from our efforts to end child marriage, which were going steadily down, now increasing the predicted amount of um, child brides uh, by 10 million, just by girls not being in school, there not being opportunities for intervention, um, uh, families on the brink making those choices. Similar themes around gender-based violence and particularly intimate partner violence with um, shelters having to reduce capacity mm -hmm. um, with folks stuck at home with abusers in lockdowns, the shadow pandemic as the secretary general and others have come to call this. Um, incredible numbers of disruption of contraceptive access, um, pr a predicted 1.4 million unintended pregnancies, um, inability to uh, get access to health or legal care. And, uh, and really, we had seen this beautifully uh, increasing trend of reducing the feminization of, of poverty. Um, that's definitely been reversed by a margin UN Women predicts of having supposed to have dropped 3% um, to uh, predicted to increase by 10%. So across the board, we do see the pandemic reversing these gains. However, 
I would argue that this moment does uh, provide a political imperative, and I'm seeing this definitely in my own country, um, which is the United States, and is the only industrialized nation without paid parental leave. Um, and there has been unprecedented and bipartisan, because in our country we only have two parties that don't have any power, um, support for massive investments in leave and starting to frame this conversation around investments in the care economy and these sorts of things. So I think feminists are organizing, they are linking, uh, linking arms and building bridges across movements. I think I've heard the word intersectionality in every session so far today, which is to be celebrated. Um, so being able to make those bridges, increase our numbers, increase our power, and then capitalize on this moment that has wrought such destruction and reverse progress, but might well re-evaluate uh, re the calculus that we thought we knew in terms of what kind of massive um, level of investment in our rights and, um, and in the, the, those marginalized populations who have been so um, targeted by this pandemic and this um, growing forces of opposition. So that's my um, note of optimism on what we can do about it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I now have another question that I want to um, ask to Mirna of Indigenous Initiatives for Peace. And that question is, what do you think have been the main achievements advancing women and girls' human rights over the past 25 years? Thanks. Bueno, en general, yo muchas gracias. Agradezco por la invitación al gobierno de México, al gobierno de Francia, a las mujeres y a las organizadoras. Estoy bien en el canal. Sí. Yo diría que el principal avance tiene que ver con el marco normativo, tal como se ha señalado. Eh, El, el hecho es que en las últimas décadas las mujeres hemos conquistado importantes derechos y sumado a los derechos que las mujeres en general han conquistado, yo diría que las mujeres indígenas por el hecho de lograr la adopción de la declaración de la ONU sobre derechos de los pueblos indígenas eh, es un compromiso de parte de todos los estados para apoyar el empoderamiento de las mujeres indígenas y asegurar la participación plena y efectiva en los procesos de adopción de decisiones en todos los niveles sociales y políticos. Como mujer indígena considero que en estos últimos años, estos 25, 26 años, nosotros nos hemos fortalecido mucho como redes de mujeres indígenas. Nos hemos transformado en protagonistas indiscutibles en los procesos de cambio, en la relación entre los pueblos y los estados. Y hemos posicionado nuestras demandas en ámbitos nacionales, regionales e internacionales. Y en la actualidad estas demandas están centrándose en situaciones particulares que abarcan no solo aspectos que tienen que ver con derechos individuales de las mujeres, sino principalmente con derechos colectivos de nuestros pueblos. Creo que hemos logrado trabajar mucho en la transmisión intergeneracional. El movimiento de mujeres indígenas tiene un fuerte contingente de mujeres jóvenes que están eh, participando eh, de forma muy activa en las distintas actividades que se desarrollan en nuestras comunidades. Para nosotras las mujeres indígenas, un logro fundamental ha sido retar el concepto de violencia y hemos podido ampliar ese concepto hacia aspectos que tienen que ver con violencia ecológica, con violencia ambiental. Ahora escuchamos mucho hablar sobre defensoras ambientalistas, pues la verdad es que ese es un resultado de el aporte tan 
impacto teórico como práctico de las mujeres indígenas. Y me parece que un aporte importantísimo en el marco de la pandemia es que hemos logrado visibilizar más los conocimientos de las mujeres indígenas. Nosotras hemos podido, en el marco de esta pandemia, rescatar nuevamente prácticas de sanación, espiritualidad, medicina tradicional, prácticas de reciprocidad y de economía comunitarias. En fin, hemos podido posicionar como un componente central de la resiliencia los conocimientos de las mujeres y de los pueblos indígenas. Ya. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to ask them the same question to Ilaria of IDLA. Thank you, Lauren, and many thanks to the organizers for having invited IDLO to this very, very important conversation. Uh, before moving to your question, Lauren, let me just say a few words from the IDLO perspective. We are an international organization that works uh, exclusively on just and the rule of law with the overall aim to achieve uh, peace and sustainable development. And from our perspective, um, working every day on justice and rule of law issues, what we are seeing is a real gender justice crisis. Uh, colleagues have uh, talked about uh, multiple intersecting forms of human rights violations that women and girls experience. Uh, what we see at Adelo is that one among the multiple forms of uh, disproportionate uh, violations that women experience is definitely the lack of equality before the law and the denial of access to justice. Now, justice for women, including access to justice for breach of rights, is first and foremost a basic human right. It is reflected in the core international human rights instruments, but it is also an essential ingredient of gender equality. And it cannot be denied to any woman or girl during times of crisis, especially COVID-19. It is central to the enjoyment of other rights, and it's also critical to achieving peaceful and inclusive societies. Why did I say that we are facing a real gender justice crisis? It's because uh, research shows that two thirds of the overall world's population actually lack meaningful access to justice. And while people in all countries are affected, the burden of this injustice is not randomly distributed. It falls mostly on women. And so we see that inadequate legal protection and guarantees affect over 2.5 billion women and girls in multiple ways. This means that on average, women have just three quarters of the legal rights afforded to men. And that happens across the world where women are still unable to access and navigate justice institutions because of a mix of political, economic and social factors. As a result, justice outcomes are rarely fully in line with international standards or constitutional guarantees. Now, uh, I painted quite uh, a, a, a sad, let's say, picture, but you asked me about achievements over the past 25 years. So let me move to perhaps some of the highlights that we have also seen at, uh, across countries in our, in our work. Well, we have seen that while only a handful of countries had laws to criminalize domestic violence in the early 1990s. At the moment, uh, data from 2018 shows that actually 76% of countries now have such laws. So that's a, a, a pretty good jump. And of the 45 countries that do not have laws, 
Nine at least have aggravated penalties for specific types of abuse committed by spouses or family member. Now that uh, doesn't mean that things are going well. We all know that GBV is on the rise, intimate partner violence is on the rise, but at least we have the legal frameworks mostly in place and we now have to work on implementation. We also have seen since 1995, uh, a rising number of women parliamentarians around the world. Uh, so uh, now we have more than, uh, the number of actually more than doubled uh, and several countries have gender balanced cabinets. And finally, let me mention women's participation in the justice sector, which has significantly increased over the past years. Um, as of 2016, women composed 50% of the professional judges on average across OECD countries. Although uh, we are still very much behind in, uh, in a high number of countries, but overall the trend is, is a positive one. So again, that is not to say that things are necessarily going well, but at least we have seen some progress. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you so much. Um, may I ask the same question to Helena of the Colectivo Caminando uh, Sin Fronteras? Sí, bueno, primero agradecer esta invitación y a todas las personas que organizan el, el foro. Eh, bueno, nosotras lo que estamos viendo es que el COVID eh, es un efecto expulsión. Ya muchas mujeres eran expulsadas de sus territorios y ahora el COVID está también expulsando a las mujeres, ¿no? Y en un contexto de fronteras más cerradas. Entonces, lo que estamos viendo es que los dos grandes enemigos de las mujeres en los territorios de frontera, que son las, las empresas de venta de armamento que, que están negociando con el control migratorio y las redes criminales eh, que negocian también con el sufrimiento de los cuerpos de las mujeres se están reforzando y por lo tanto el contexto está llevando una mayor violencia contra las mujeres en contextos de, de movimiento. ¿no? Eh, ha aumentado la violencia sexual sistemática porque sabéis que en los territorios de frontera eh, las mujeres, eh, es una situación de guerra de baja intensidad por la implicación de las empresas de armamento y por lo tanto hay la violencia sexual como arma de guerras contra las mujeres se está implementando también cada vez más en este contexto de cerramiento de fronteras, ¿no? Pero por otro lado también tenemos que decir que las mujeres se están organizando porque en los contextos de frontera, en los territorios sabemos que primero las mujeres son invisibilizadas eh, y segundo son criminalizadas o victimizadas, ¿no? eh, siempre son presentadas como víctimas de las mafias pero no como sujetas de derecho y por lo tanto estamos viendo organización de mujeres defensoras de derechos de personas migrantes, sobre todo defensoras del derecho a la vida cuando cruzas la frontera y estamos viendo eh, que responden, eh, plantan cara a esas industrias de la esclavitud y de la explotación. ¿no? Y también que las madres eh, se están organizando para buscar a las personas muertas y desaparecidas, a sus hijos e hijas que están muriendo en esa guerra de fronteras. Por lo tanto, tenemos un, un, um, como, un defi, uh, como, como un um, como un defi que tenemos eh, que afrontar en, en este futuro y es qué está pasando con todas las mujeres en movimiento porque el movimiento va a continuar y en este contexto de crisis y de pandemia los movimientos se van a agravar y las mujeres van a salir y estamos viendo que están saliendo más con sus hijos y con sus hijas responder, luchar contra el racismo institucional luchar contra el feminicidio en las zonas de frontera pero sobre todo poner a las mujeres migrantes y sus necesidades en el centro y también en, en estos espacios es muy importante para afrontar lo que, lo que nos viene. Gracias. Thank you so much. And now I've got two additional questions to ask the panel, and I'll go in this, the order but backwards. So my first question, uh, sorry, my next question is to Helena. 
again. And the question is, what are the social, economic and political conditions that have contributed to these advancements on women and girls' human rights? Sí, bueno, creo que la, la clave muy importante es que las mujeres en nuestro contexto, las mujeres son expulsadas de los territorios, son mujeres que están defendiendo la vida eh, dentro de sus territorios por lo que llamamos la necropolítica. Yo creo que las mujeres están dentro de esa vanguardia que está luchando contra esa necropolítica, entendiendo la necropolítica como hacer morir y dejar morir a determinadas poblaciones. Entonces son las mujeres las que están luchando por esa defensa de la vida. Pero cuando son expulsadas de sus territorios porque no pueden continuar defendiendo allí la vida, se encuentran con, una, con otra necropolítica en su camino migratorio y en los países de destino contra la que están luchando también y que está sujeta también, que está eh, sometida a un racismo institucional que está operando en todos los países. Y el cuerpo de las mujeres además tiene una, eh, como una significación diferente dentro de la necropolítica, porque no solo hacer morir y dejar morir, sino que los cuerpos, el sufrimiento del cuerpo de las mujeres a través de la explotación sexual, pero también a través de la explotación laboral, en condiciones que son prácticamente de esclavitud en los países de destino, también está operando ¿no? en toda esa lógica. Yo creo que ese es el contexto socioeconómico en el que se encuentran ahora mismo esta lucha, estas luchas. Thank you so much. May I ask the same question back to Ilaria? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Lauren. So in uh, 2019, we published a report together with the uh, UN Women and others on justice for women, um, highlighting what works to advance justice for women. So what are the uh, social, political, and economic conditions that favor um, justice for women and make justice for women work. Um, mostly we found that working on the elimination of discriminatory laws actually is a huge advantage. Uh, adopting gender responsive laws um, can provide a framework for the realization of women's rights, as well as protection from all forms of discrimination against women. Also, uh, it is essential to prevent and respond to intimate partner violence. Um, now, this uh, issue has moved to the top of the global and in many countries national agenda, uh, but it, this is just a part of a very large puzzle to prevent violence against women. Um, the work of human rights bodies at the global, regional and national levels actually has played a key role in promoting legal reforms in all countries. Uh, supported by collective action by women groups, a mobilization, um, the women's rights movements. Uh, these are all uh, contributing factors to um, the, the underlying conditions to improve gender equality. Then, of course, there is a uh, extremely important question of overcoming disadvantage for poor and marginalized women. So we need to act on focused and targeted policies and programs that focus on those most left behind. Uh, we haven't mentioned disabled women uh, or uh, the, the most marginalized ethnic minorities, uh, the, the, the poorest. Uh, so we need to really uh, work on justice interventions th that can be integrated if you want into poverty reduction and social protection programs and co covering an increasing number of low-income countries. These could, for example, include access to legal aid, support from paralegal services, legal awareness and legal literacy, uh, and uh, let me mention also the importance of empowering women economically and as rights holders. 
So ensuring justices to services and opportunities as it relates, for example, to legal identity documents. Many women simply do not have ID card. Registrations, business permits, setting at server in decision making at all levels, and finally. Mentioned that we also need uh, information and empirical evidence to respond with evidence based policies. So, uh, survey findings, anything that really makes us touch with firsthand the reality. Uh, of, of, of women worldwide and, uh, and the injustices they suffer will help target interventions uh, and make them more impactful in the long term. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, may I ask that same question now to Marina as well? Muchas gracias. Yo creo que la principal condición ha sido la movilización de las mujeres. O sea, la movilización de las mujeres en todos los niveles, desde el nivel comunitario, local, hasta el nivel internacional. Ha sido la principal condición. Nosotros decimos que no logramos nada regalado, que todo lo conquistamos con nuestro trabajo. Creo que el segundo aspecto es que la, por lo menos para las mujeres indígenas, el hecho de que el modelo colonial se esté reforzando en el mundo y que ese modelo colonial de alguna manera pone sobre la mesa la necesidad de la interseccionalidad ha sido un factor importante porque si no seguiríamos viendo las cosas de forma homogénea. Creo que el hecho de que las mujeres negras, las mujeres indígenas, las mujeres con discapacidad, realmente estemos siendo las que más nos morimos, las que más somos criminalizados, pues hace que el resto de la sociedad se dé cuenta que hay algo que no está funcionando bien que a pesar de que tenga, tengamos marcos normativos, a pesar de que tengamos una institucionalidad para abordar el tema de las mujeres, algo está fallando. Y ahora, por eso ustedes mismas dicen que ahora escuchan mucho el discurso de la interseccionalidad. Pues ojalá después de este foro no quede solo en el discurso y realmente todo el mundo comience a aplicar de verdad un lente interseccional, porque yo diría que ese es el mayor desafío que enfrentamos. O sea, el desafío de la desigualdad y la colonización creciente tiene que ver con la ausencia de un fondo, de una mirada interseccional cuando hablamos sobre las mujeres. Me parece que el otro aspecto que tiene que ver con las mujeres indígenas es el avance en, en la preocupación sobre el cambio climático. De repente ahora todo el mundo sabe que los pueblos indígenas somos los mejores protectores de la biodiversidad. Somos los, las mujeres indígenas, prestamos servicios ambientales que tienen que ver con protección del agua y que todo eso lo hacemos a partir de nuestros conocimientos. Eso ha favorecido que ahora también haya más interés por abordar el tema de las mujeres con una visión más integral. Y me parece que el otro factor relevante es que nosotras mismas, las mujeres indígenas, promovemos iniciativas con un enfoque holístico. Nosotros no estamos promoviendo iniciativas que solo ven salud. No, salud tiene que ver con la salud del planeta, tiene que ver con la salud de las plantas, tiene que ver con los espíritus. Nosotros no estamos pensando en la recuperación o el enfrentamiento COVID solo como un tema de salud, sino como un tema que tiene que ver 
con soberanía alimentaria, tiene que ver con derecho territorial, tiene que ver con la transmisión de los abuelos y las abuelas a las nuevas generaciones. Entonces, ese enfoque integral que nosotras mismas, las mujeres indígenas, hemos puesto en las acciones que nosotros desarrollamos, pues obviamente eso ha contribuido a que también estemos sobre la agenda. Y ya se ha señalado, tenemos más mujeres indígenas participando en política en distintos niveles, en condiciones terribles, condiciones discriminadas por todo el mundo, pero ahí estamos, peleando los espacios, eh, pulgada a pulgada, y yo creo que demostrar esa capacidad de lucha y esa capacidad de resiliencia es lo que nos tiene a donde estamos. Y esperamos que este tipo de eventos realmente sirva para que todo el resto de la gente comience a valorarnos de una forma más respetuosa, de una forma más digna. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much, Marina. The next question is, what should government, civil society, international organizations, and the private sector be doing to accelerate women and girls' human rights fulfillment within the next decade? And if I might ask that first of all to Lyric. Certainly. So this is my favorite part of the conversation because it's what are we gonna do about it? And this is my favorite part of the forum because it was organized around action, around uh, moving, as we've just heard, beyond rhetoric to action. So the, the obvious answer here is that all of those groups, because we are all here together, can make strong commitments across each of the six action coalitions and the Women, Peace and Security Compact. And I'd like to give an illustrative recommendation for each one, I'll be very brief. But I think we want these to be smart, you know, specific, measurable, achievable, although I would invite us to really include some stretch goals. It may not be achievable this year, but we have, I think, a five-year five time horizon. We have immense need that we have just documented across all of our speakers, and now is really the time to, to, to try to push ourselves forward. Um, so all of those actors can and should make commitments at the, at the forum. In the era, area of gender-based violence, I think that uh, much change can be made by both countries as well as the private sector working to ratify or implement the um, ILO Convention 190, which is about the issue of gender-based violence in the world of work. This is something that is very broadly defined in terms of violence, covers lots of different forms of violence, as well as the world of work is broadly defined. It's really an incredible mechanism, and it's one that I think um, is uh, relatively uh, painless from a budgetary perspective. Um, on the Economic Justice and Rights Action Coalition, really encouraging countries to make strong investments in the care economy, particularly in the context of COVID, which has brought such um, disproportionate impacts in terms of accelerating uh, women's uh, uh, withdrawal from the workforce, increased un unpaid burdens of care, and then the unpaid, unsafe, or underpaid care work that is done by our largely female healthcare workers, many of whom are women of color. Um, that very much needs to be addressed on a systematic and large scale. In bodily autonomy and sexual and reproductive health and rights, we're calling for um, really robust um, uptake uh, and rollout of comprehensive sexuality education and affordable services across the board. Having just come from the last two weeks of the Commission on the Status of Women, this is one of the areas where consensus is hardest to reach. And it's also, we know at the International Center for Research on Women, one of the areas where the uh, impacts and, and outcomes in terms of benefits is easiest to document and really a no-brainer. So very, very important call to action there. On feminist action for climate justice, um, we're calling on countries to um, ensure that their green financing is gender transformative and to integrate a gender analysis into all climate action plans and policies. In technology and innovation for gender equality, this is where I'd really love to see leadership by the private sector. 
Um, there, it's very, it's notoriously difficult to regulate um, technology facilitated violence, gender-based violence. Um, and we really believe that governments need to try harder to do that. And companies need to um, try harder to treat that as the human rights abuse that it is and um, to shut it down. Finally, on feminist movements and leadership, there are so many innovative forms of policy making that are happening across the world. Feminist foreign policies, feminist governments, some of the innovative mechanisms that we heard about earlier. Um, so we really encourage countries to commit to making feminist policy processes in both their national and foreign policy. Thank you. Thank you so much. And can I now ask that same question to Charlotte, please? Yes, thank you. And following Lyric's outline, excellent outline of the specifics that we're asking for in the immediate, I'm going to go to that longer term that she referred to, which is some of the principles that I think need to be done in order for these specifics to happen, but for many more to happen. And I would start with the point being made about inequalities. I do think that inequalities is at the core of all of the issues that we're talking about. The inequalities of gender, of race, of ethnicity, of nations, North, South, of poor, rich, et cetera. So I think that one of the first things we have to do is to put the question of inequality with a gendered lens at the center of all of these questions, which is to look at all the details and say, what are the inequalities and how is gender a part of that in every single area that we're approaching? And I think that that really would change, just as we used to say in feminism, woman identified woman was about putting women at the center of how you saw things. I think that putting inequalities at the center of how we view the world would have a dramatic impact on how we think about issues, starting with the COVID vaccine, um, which is one of the deepest inequalities just coming back from Peru to the US. I'm very really aware of the depth of that inequality all over the world. Secondly, I think I would say the principle of listening to, investing in and believing what women are saying that the support of hearing women's voices and the diversity of women's voices, and particularly the support of progressive women's and feminist and human rights movements uh, in all their diversity, disability rights, sex workers, uh, many of the claims for LGBT rights, putting all of these movements again in the framework of what it is we're seeking to give as a solution. So I give an example, Mirna's point about indigenous women having a key to the climate issue. That, that's very clear. If we were to listen to and actually take that voice and put it at the center of policymaking, we'd have an entirely different climate policy uh, right there. And I think you could take this through on many, many of the other issues. Um, certainly ending discriminatory laws. That was one of the things the Beijing platform called for by the year 2000. And here we are 25 years later and we're nowhere near that. Ending discriminatory laws and access to justice, which has been talked about, providing that access to justice. These are key aspects of inequality. Uh, access to justice is probably one of the most uh, important things that keeps women in violent situations because they don't have any alternative access to justice, as well as the lack of social and economic fundamental social security rights. And I would expand on something that I think Larry said about care work. The recognition of the care economy and care work is not only um, the work that women are most invested in, but if we began to increase the value, we would reach pay equity so much faster if all those jobs that have to do with care work from domestic work at home to nurses and people who take care of our lives to every area of care work, teachers, somebody asked in the questions about young girls education. We could go so far with a serious investment 
and how we're going to catch children up to education standards that they've missed uh, in the past year. And that involves care work, teachers, many of these are women's jobs, pay equity. Uh, if you look at what, what we pay for what kind of work, uh, immediately uh, would be one of the solutions to that question. Um, and finally, I think I want to return back to the women's human rights defenders. If we would make a firm commitment to defend the women who are advancing all of these ideas and movements and seeking to show the way, uh, we would have such a richness. Not only would we be saving their lives, but we would have a, such a richness of solutions. And I point, for example, to the academic studies on the changes in policy on violence against women. And they all say what mattered was not the left or right status of the government. What mattered was whether there was an activist feminist movement pushing these issues onto the agenda, which brings us to the whole question of political power and the recognition of feminist and human rights movements as the drivers for this political power. And just to throw my last point in for the UN, how about some recognition of real power for civil society? That could make a huge difference in our uh, gender equity um, in the United Nations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charlotte. And then finally, that last question over to you, Gladys. Muchísimas gracias. Realmente ya no tengo nada que decir. Después de todo lo que acabo de escuchar, realmente extraordinario. Me ha encantado escucharlas. He aprendido muchísimo. Me parece extraordinariamente claro lo que se ha dicho. Yo solamente voy a complementar algunas cosas que tienen que ver un poco con, con lo que hay que hacer en la, en la próxima década inspirada en el, los diálogos que nosotros tenemos con los estados parte en el comité CEDAO. Eh, yo creo que se necesita verdaderamente volver a pensar el tema de la fiscalidad. La fiscalidad tiene que ser progresiva y tiene que ser redistributiva. No podemos seguir en un mundo en donde las, uh -huh. los países, los estados, no tienen recursos para enfrentar la política social. Entonces, yo creo que se necesita definitivamente un trabajo muy serio sobre la fiscalidad. En segundo lugar, hay que redefinir el tema de la cooperación internacional. Creo que la cooperación internacional tiene que ser renovada realmente para que responda a, a los retos que vienen eh, con una mayor inclusión del sur global. O sea, se tiene que terminar la cooperación eh, vertical del norte al sur. Tiene que venir una nueva forma de cooperación internacional. Eh, en tercer lugar, creo que es muy importante rediseñar nuevas políticas multidimensionales de reducción y de erradicación de la pobreza. Porque evidentemente la pandemia ha mostrado que todo lo que se hizo antes fue muy limitado. Muy rápidamente se borraron las, la, los, los avances. Y, y, la, y las personas regresaron, eran pobres antes, tuvieron unos años en que fueron menos pobres y volvieron a la pobreza. Entonces, eso no fue un trabajo serio. Creo que la multidimensionalidad de la reducción y de la eliminación de la pobreza, sobre todo enfocándose en lo que llamamos y hemos estudiado hasta muchos, muchos años, es la feminización de la pobreza y su transmisión generacional. Esto es lo que tenemos que cortar verdaderamente. Eh, luego creo que es muy importante, ya lo han dicho, pero lo, re lo reitero, una mayor inversión social en lo que se va a denominar y se está denominando esta economía del cuidado. Y tenemos que mirar la salud de otra manera. Y la salud tiene que ser para las mujeres con una protección especial de la salud sexual y reproductiva. Y la educación para las mujeres, para nuestras niñas, tiene que estar enfocada no solamente en darle conocimientos, sino en darle instrumentos para la vida, como es la educación sexual adecuada a la edad, y un énfasis en el acceso a las ciencias, a la tecnología, sobre todo digital, a las ingenierías y a las matemáticas. Esto tiene que entrar verdaderamente 
en, en, el, en el imaginario de nuestras niñas para el futuro. Por otro lado, aquí se ha aclarado muy bien la importancia de la justicia, me ha encantado eso, el fortalecimiento de una justicia de proximidad accesible, eficiente, una justicia que verdaderamente sirva a quienes más lo necesitan, a quienes han estado excluidas de la justicia. Justamente hemos hablado de las mujeres con discapacidad, las mujeres indígenas, las mujeres afrodescendientes, no podían acceder a la justicia como un bien fundamental, pues tienen que acceder. Y los planes tienen que ser para facilitar ese acceso, pero no cualquier acceso, es un acceso de una justicia respetuosa del pluralismo jurídico, respetuosa del enfoque de género e intercultural, y que también haya paridad entre jueces y agentes de justicia. Por otro lado, tiene que aplicarse esto que llamamos la debida diligencia para, para no solamente prevenir, sino también para sancionar y para reparar gravísimos delitos de discriminación, de racismo, de violencia, de todas las formas de violencia de género. Y no quiero eh, olvidar decir algo. Marcos legales tienen que seguirse fortaleciendo, pero tienen que cumplirse. No se cumplen los marcos legales, los, los estándares internacionales, y muchas veces se ratifican las convenciones, pero como si nada. No llega a la población, no llega a las mujeres, no llega a las niñas. Entonces, esto tiene que modificarse en estos 10 años futuros. Y también tienen que haber políticas laborales de expansión del mercado laboral formal. Las mujeres están ubicadas en la informalidad, están, en, en, están sobre representadas en la precariedad de los sistemas económicos. Necesitamos que tengan trabajo formal, que tengan sistemas de protección social, que tengan estímulos económicos, servicios financieros dirigidos a mujeres. Necesitamos mayor desarrollo institucional y presupuestal de los mecanismos de las mujeres dentro del poder ejecutivo que tengan realmente presencia a nivel nacional. Necesitamos una gobernanza inclusiva y representativa. Hay que expandir la paridad en la vida política y en la toma de decisiones cualitativamente, tal como lo ha explicado Charlotte. Tenemos que hacer pensar en que hayan promociones. El Estado tiene que dar promociones al sector privado en relación a la contratación paritaria de mujeres y en relación a su acceso a los niveles de toma de decisión. Tiene que haber una urgente erradicación de esto que llamamos formas nocivas contra las niñas, el matrimonio infantil, el, el matrimonio adolescente, el embarazo adolescente, toda práctica nociva que limite la capacidad de decisión de las mujeres y de las niñas en sus vidas. Y por último, no quiero, lo he dejado al último, pero ya Mirna lo explicó con toda claridad. Tenemos verdaderamente que darle una particular atención a la puesta en marcha de políticas referidas al desafío climático con esta activa participación. Las maestras son las mujeres indígenas. Ellas no solamente tienen con conocimientos ancestrales, tienen una cosmovisión que es una cosmovisión que verdaderamente no, no es para salvarlas a ellas, ni siquiera es solamente para salvar sus territorios y el agua donde viven y donde viven sus comunidades. Estamos hablando ya no de una sobrevivencia particular, estamos hablando de tomar decisiones para que ellas nos orienten en esto que llamamos la sobrevivencia de la humanidad, pero en un sentido holístico. Eso es lo que necesitamos. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. Thank you all. And with that, we can now open to, there's an echo again, excuse me. With that, we can open now to questions from the audience. And the first one of those questions is, where do you think youth CSOs are lacking currently? And what can we do to help or improve the work we do in the field of human rights? So that's a question of how youth CSOs can improve the work that they do in the field of human rights. Um, is there any of the panelists who volunteer to take that question? You can maybe just raise your hand.
Shall I pass that first um, to Charlotte and then maybe Lyric can jump in afterwards? Thank you. Okay, yes. Well, actually, I, I, I want to say something about youth, not so much youth CSOs, uh, because that sounds like organizations. I think that youth today, women today, have been in the forefront of almost all the important struggles of the last couple of years in Latin America around violence against women. It's the young women who have been on the street leading us to talk about rape, leading us to talk about ni una menos, leading us to uh, move on issues that yes, have been on the agenda since Beijing, but need a new energy. And I think that youth CSOs need to bring that energy of the youth movements into conversations like this, uh, need to be empowered to do that. But I also think that certainly when I was a young activist and what I see in my young student activists is it's being out there, they used to call it the shock troops, being out there on the street, getting attention to things that have been left behind with new and innovative and creative energy. Certainly in the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States, which had a transformative impact over the last year, it was mostly young men and women, but many young women uh, who were fueling that movement. So I think youth have a very important role. I see them already playing it. We could give many more examples, I'm sure, from other parts of the world. And the, the CSOs should make sure that they're channeling that youth energy into the conversations uh, like this one. So I, I'm, I'm actually feeling that I can retire more because I see the youth energy is already out there for these issues. That's what I was going to say as well. It's just that I, I, I would, I would actually dispute the the framing of the question. I don't, I haven't seen a single issue we work on at the International Center for Research on Women that youth activists aren't organizing and leading and pushing, um, pushing the boundaries even beyond where you know it, definitely institutions or even civil society organizations are. And I think that's healthy. And I commend the Generation Equality Forum process for making space for that. There wasn't initially a youth role in the governance structure for this. And guess who raised their hand and said there should be youth activists. And then that has been, there's been a, a very thorough, I think, process of mainstreaming that. There's a feminist man, a young feminist manifesto that they have that they have published. Um, so I think there's lots of opportunities to organize and where there aren't. They ask for them, and I would say do, do more of that. Thank you so much. And I think, Helena, you also had your hand up to answer this question, so I pass the floor to you. And then to Myrna, and then we'll move on to the next question. Thank you. Eh, sí, yo lo que quería decir es que las jóvenes tienen una responsabilidad de construir ese feminismo que no deja a nadie atrás, ¿no? Una de las principales ¿no? fricciones que hay dentro de las mujeres en este momento es la construcción de un feminismo que no ha tenido en cuenta la diversidad de las mujeres, ¿no? que está atravesado por el racismo, que está atravesado por el colonialismo, que, está, que muchas veces eh, que unas mujeres tengan derechos está no por encima de una igualdad real, sino por encima del sufrimiento de otras mujeres. Y por lo tanto creo que las jóvenes tienen la responsabilidad de abrir ese camino y de conseguir un feminismo verdaderamente que no deje a nadie atrás. Y es un buen momento para hacer esa reflexión desde la juventud. Coincido totalmente con el planteamiento de Elena. Me parece que la juventud tiene la oportunidad de descolonizar el movimiento de mujeres y el feminismo si queremos realmente avanzar hacia la igualdad. Y esto significa tener conciencia de la diversidad de mujeres, tener conciencia de que efectivamente habemos mujeres que además de ser mujeres pertenecemos a colectivos que son pueblos originarios con, con derechos especiales. Si logramos descolonizar el movimiento feminista, 
podremos avanzar hacia la descolonización total, que es lo que nos genera la situación de desigualdad. Y eso definitivamente la juventud lo puede hacer, porque siento y eh, me, me parece que hay como un movimiento refrescante de juventud, abierto a escuchar la diversidad y a respetarla. Thank you so much. Now the next question that um, the next question through the chat is: How have the panelists seen the prolonged nature of this pandemic impact at the intersection of gender and disability? How can we make sure that women with disabilities are part of the discussion in building back better? Is there anyone that would like to start with answering that one? Gladys, can I pass to you? Thank you. Bueno, en primer lugar, me gustaría decir que eh, el marco de los derechos humanos es, es, es sumamente potente eh, para atender la interseccionalidad y los derechos específicos, sobre todo de las personas con discapacidad. Y creo que la riqueza que trae la, la conexión entre las convenciones, distintas convenciones de derechos humanos, y en este caso me voy a mencionar la convención sobre todas las formas de discriminación contra la mujer y la convención de los derechos de las personas con discapacidad, la, el vínculo de ambas, me parece que permite luchar contra exclusiones históricas, porque en verdad las personas con discapacidad nos traen una riqueza extraordinaria. O sea, nos permiten una comprensión de, 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 de la humanidad diferente de, de lo que es un mundo sin personas con discapacidad. Y por esta razón es muy, muy importante, lo, lo he aprendido además porque mi colega eh, en el Comité de, de, de España, que es ciega, me lo ha enseñado en muchas oportunidades. Es decir, se permite... Una, realmente una humanización de, del mundo y por esta razón no, no se debe aceptar que hayan las escuelas separadas para las personas con discapacidad y el resto, el, el resto como entre comillas los normales. No, es al revés. Lo que tenemos que hacer es mezclarnos, tenemos que trabajar juntos para un mundo que es diferente y que eh, va a ser un mundo muchísimo más abierto, va a ser un mundo muchísimo más inclusivo y que tiene una forma de, de, de ajustarse a, a, la, a la discapacidad que es muy, pero muy interesante e importante. O sea, creo que verdaderamente debemos dejar de pensar, así como dijimos que las mujeres indígenas no, son, no están trabajando para ellas, están trabajando para una mejora de la humanidad. Yo digo lo mismo en relación a la conexión con las personas con discapacidad y sus derechos. Nos están trayendo lo que es parte de una diversidad humana y nos permite humanizar realmente la protección de los derechos humanos de una forma mucho más contundente que antes. Gracias. Thank you so much. And Ilaria, your hand was up. I passed the floor to you. Thanks. Thank you, Lauren. Um, I think that uh, the, the question of women with disability needs to be fit within the broader approach that we all need to have on uh, those most left behind. And uh, the uh, Agenda 2030, as we know, has a very strong, uh, at least on paper, focus on those uh, most left behind. Now, as we also all know very well from the lesson from Beijing and, uh, and other fora, is that there is a, a huge gap between what's on paper and then what the political will and the reality is. Uh, 25, 30 years later, we see enormous gaps in the promises of Beijing and other platforms. So uh, it's really a question of focusing the political will and our advocacy 
on those who most are voiceless and who have not been able to carve that space in political decision making in the public life in the life of of our of our planet so it's essential that political will is there but it is also followed by very strong advocacy so uh, i would really like to see uh marginalized groups vulnerable so-called vulnerable groups but those who have had uh who haven't had the chance that others have had to raise their voice and and grow in advocacy and make their case and be heard so it's often a question of of become uh, heard at the global level so it's it's important for us to be uh the 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 recipient of those voices, but also the megaphone for those voices. So I am very glad that we we had that question, and I would definitely encourage uh, civil society to bring it forward as as much as possible. Thank you. Thanks very much, and I'll just turn to Elena to respond if you can quite quite quickly to that one, and I'm going to try and squeeze one more question in before we finish, if we're able. Sí, yo quería responder al tema de la pandemia. ¿no? Eh, por ejemplo, en el Estado español eh, se ha constatado que las mujeres que estaban en el sector de los cuidados tenían la misma incidencia de COVID que, la, que el personal sanitario, ¿no? eh, que ha aumentado la violencia machista, puesto que las mujeres estaban obligadas a estar encerradas y tenían menos acceso a la denuncia. Eh, que en otros lugares que ha afectado pues, a las mujeres que estaban en, en situaciones de explotación sexual o, o trabajadoras sexuales. ¿no? Y yo creo que la pandemia eh, tiene que ser analizada en clave de género, tiene que ser analizada en cómo ha afectado de forma diferenciada a las, a las mujeres y también este análisis debe servir para la reconstrucción. Yo creo que los estados y las organizaciones sociales no han hecho todavía el esfuerzo suficiente para hacer ese análisis diferenciado y a partir de ahí empezar la reconstrucción y el impacto ¿no? que esto ha tenido en la vida de las mujeres, un impacto económico, pero también un impacto social y un impacto de acceso a derechos. Entonces yo lanzo esta cuestión a los estados hay que analizar ese impacto y hay que implementar medidas que lo, que lo mitiguen. Thank you so much. I'm just going to try and squeeze one last question in. So I'll just, I'll ask the question and invite just one person to speak to it quite quickly, but it's an important one. And it's about women human rights defenders face disproportionate violence and repression compared to men. However, despite international efforts, the authorities haven't improved this situation. What can we do to uh, address the violence against women human rights defenders? Thank you so much, Gladys. And if I could just ask you again, just to keep it to one quick, yeah. one yeah. quick bullet point. Eh, Thank you. Me, me gustaría eh, decir que el comité toma muy en, en, muy en serio el tema de las defensoras de derechos humanos y que y quisiera invitar a, a quienes presentan informes eh, en nombre de la sociedad civil y las organizaciones feministas y de mujeres, por favor, que sean bien eh, puntuales cuando presentan esto, porque nosotros hacemos estas preguntas a los estados. Y quiero decir, los estados son responsables de la seguridad de las defensoras de derechos humanos. Y ese es nuestro trabajo, es recordarles esto a los estados. Muchas gracias. I see two other hands up, Charlotte and Myrna. Um, we've got four minutes left. Um, Charlotte, Myrna, can you say something in about 30 seconds? If you can, if you can answer in 30 seconds, please do. Charlotte, please. Okay, well, first of all, I want to say that there is a session tomorrow in the special sessions uh, on human rights defenders. So I hope everyone interested in this question will find that in the program. And they have a, a series of proposals, in fact, a, a series of demands that are being made from this conference. So I hope that we could maybe amplify that 
in response to this question because they're actually quite concrete measures uh, around women's security that women are human rights defenders are demanding of governments, beginning with actually making information available about how many women have been affected by this because it, it's been like an underground movement many of us have participated in, but it hasn't yet reached the level of government attention. So I'm gonna stop my 30 seconds with, let's get that list and circulate it. It's coming out tomorrow in the session. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Mirna, are you able to respond in about 30 seconds? Yes. Claro que sí. Las defensoras de, dere de derechos humanos indígenas tienen que tener un abordaje diferente por la articulación entre los derechos colectivos y los derechos individuales y requieren de medidas especiales que aborden el aspecto colectivo. Lo dejo para todos los que trabajan en eso, incluyendo los estados. Thank you so much, Mirna, and I'm really pleased you had the chance to answer, even if that was really quick, because I think that was very important. Um, that is the last question that we'll have time for. And clearly we're grappling with a number of big issues here and, and there's much to unpack, um, but we will have to end it for today. I'll just flag, I, I mean, I couldn't even try and summarize the richness of, of this conversation, which I've just found fascinating. Um, I think one of the issues that's come up again and again is the importance of leaving no one behind. As Ilaria said, that that needs targeted policies and programs, and is of course tied to the need to, show, to ensure attention to intersectional discrimination and making sure we're really moving from words to action. And then related to that is making sure we don't leave any issue behind. Um, and that includes issues such as sexual and reproductive rights, where it's historically been really difficult to get consensus but as, as Charlotte was saying, as soon as we see one right, it's, it's a hugely important set of rights on its own. And as soon as we see one set of rights eroded, we know there's the, the risk of a domino effect as well. Um, of course, the, the, the just some of the many, many things that have been highlighted in this conversation, which has been carefully recorded. So with that, I'd just like to really thank our speakers for their reflections and their insights and everything they've shared with us. And I'd also like to thank our pa um, the participants and the audience for, for your participation and, and for the excellent questions. I wish we'd had time for more of them. Um, and thank you all very much. I hope everyone enjoys the rest of the conference. Goodbye. Thank you, Lauren. Listo, Gerardo, Carla, pues afortunadamente creo que se dio. Y bueno, estás en mute. Ya vi, perdón. Este, bueno, afortunadamente no, no fueron tantos. Eh... Eh, dejamos Alguien de me ha no, otra vez, ¿por qué, me, ¿por qué me cierran el micrófono? No se me hace. <risa> este, no, pues ya eh, finalmente terminamos la sesión. Creo que fueron pocos realmente las situaciones que tuvimos con el tema de la interpretación y este, que se pudieron solucionar a tiempo. Cualquier cosa, pues sigo a sus órdenes. Mucha suerte en sus siguientes eh, sesiones y que tengan. Muchas gracias. Este, Ivonne Carla, Ivonne eh, Tonatiu, Elsa. Uh, thanks, Karin. Thanks, Shawana, for assisting us. Muchísimas gracias por el apoyo. Nos vemos en la noche. See you tomorrow, Karin. Gracias. Gracias. See Bye. you. Bye. Thank you, Gerardo. Bye. Nice work. See you. Yeah.
It was nice to see you too, Karen. Yeah. Get, get, get some rest. I need it. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> I just want to take a, a, a photo of the chat. Okay. But everything is in Spanish. If, if you want, it, it, we, we can send the English version of, of those comments and questions to you. Okay, but I have 24 hours to give you the report, so. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much for your assistance and see you. Bye. Bye.